And so that kind of opened up the box. And then suddenly you realize, oh, well, everything is seasonal in Japan. And then. Hi, and welcome to Seeking Sustainability Live. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Paprika Girl, Riki Okanda. She's been on the series more than five times. And each time she joins us, she gives us great insights into Japanese culture. This time she's talking about special occasions during June, some of her favorite wagashi sweets, other traditions in Japan during this time of year, right before the heat of summer. And of course, sharing with us some insights about her true passion for kimono. So please enjoy. Paprika girl, Riki Okanda. And today you're in Fukushima, right, Riki? That's right. Today I'm in Aizu Wakamatsu. Are a writer, you are an inspiration for all of us trying to follow traditional Japanese things. You are a lover of kimono, even in your daily life. Your wonderful Twitter, of course, you have your Instagram, but you also have this、uh, website where you introduce. Some of your tweets and ideas, of which we're talking about today, like summer kimono and other ideas that you always introduce. You always, you always find new things. Even though we're talking about traditional things, you always find new things. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. There's just so much to do here and so much to learn. So you never get tired. Of, you know, in Japan, you're always uncovering new little tidbits of information and history and culture. Never get bored.、Um, it's actually my husband's grandmother.、Um, she was a geisha over in Kagurazaka、um, way, way long time ago.、Um, unfortunately, she recently passed away at the age of 98. But、uh, it was her who initially kind of adopted me even before we were married、um, as, oh, this person has、um, the potential to wear w h a t she thought maybe I'd be interested in wearing the kimono. And so she would send me a package. At least once a month, of kimono for the morning, kimono for the evening, and it, it with the colors and the styles and the flowers and the designs that are appropriate for that particular month. And it changed every single time. So that was what fascinated me initially because I didn't realize that there were so, so many differences in, in the way that the life and、uh, in the way that people live from month to month. And so that kind of opened up the box. And then suddenly you realize, well, everything is seasonal in Japan. And then you realize tea is an、uh, exceptional part of the base of why everything is seasonal in Japan. It just gets bigger and bigger all the time. I think the image of kimono is that most kimono is silk, but you always introduce a variety of different materials, especially for summer. Is it more often maybe a linen type or cotton or lighter materials? Is that right? Well, there's a, there's a linen and there's cotton.、Um, there's the dough, which is kind of like a gauze fabric. There is sha, which is a lighter weave.、Um, some of them, it all depends on the way that you weave the fabric together. So they kind of interleave the.、Um, Uh, so, you could get a much tighter weave, for example, which is uh, more uh, convenient for something earlier in the spring or late in the, after- or late in the、uh, autumn. But what really makes a kimono different for the season is the way that is how tight you're, you're weaving the fabric. And once you have, get to the, we- the winter kind of a stage, you have double layer fabric, so the air doesn't get through. Whereas in, in the summer, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's almost like you're、uh, wearing lace. So, the air just goes right through it. So, it's, it's much, it's actually、um, much cooler than something like jeans or a t shirt would be. Wow. And you've really gotten accustomed to the style of wearing kimono.、Uh, we've talked to a few people in the series who not only went to kimono school, but they spent many years learning how to wear. How did you learn? Did you go to school? Did you study just on your own? Oh, it's、uh, mostly grandmother. So,、um, when I went to grandmother's place, I would wear the kimono that she gave me because, you know, it's etiquette to do so. You wear the sweater that grandma gives you over the, over the winter, right? Well, you wear the kimono that grandma gives you. And I go there and she'll fix it and she'll be like, oh, if you tie it like this, it's, it's a little bit more, it's a little more casual. It looks like you know what you're doing. Or, you, oh, you could be nice, much looser with your eddy and your collar over here. Don't be so tight about it. And 
she would teach me all the things that um, made the kimono attractive because she was a geisha. So the way that she would wear them is slightly, it's not the usual thing you'd learn over in a kimono school where it'd be tight and formal because, oh goodness, it's kind of opening up a box here. <laughs> um, people who go to kimono school, they're usually learning how to wear them formally. The reason is, is that they're not as common as they used to be. And the only times when people tend to wear kimono is during from relatively formal occasions. So you'll have a tea ceremony or you'll have um, someone's graduation or a wedding or something like that. They won't teach you how to wear kimono casually, not usually. Um, whereas my grandmother, she, or my grandmother-in-law, she taught me how to wear them um, as if I were wearing them every day. So that way it's a little bit easier, it's less formal, it's less tight, it's a lot looser and frankly the way that she wore them especially is a little sexier. So she would, um, if you would lower the, the back of, this is called an eddy, but you lower the nape of your kimono a little bit and just to do it at the right degree kind of makes just, it's like the same thing as showing a little bit of cleavage, you know, just naughty enough to be interesting. But these are the sorts of things that uh, I learned from someone you know, who's 98 years old, who worked on every single day of her life since she was born. So, um, I don't know, it, it made it very comfortable for me. I have no, there's nothing itches. It doesn't feel like heavy or tight or constrictive the way that some people assume kimonos are going to be. And one of the things that you also introduced in a previous episode is about if you are given a kimono that's not exactly the right size for you, you can take it to a shop and they can make it longer or wider or whatever you need. Um, that that's another service you can have done at a kimono shop. Yeah. That's right. Interestingly enough, kimono, when they're sewn, they don't tend to, you don't cut the kimono, uh, especially for the sleeves and places like that. What you do is you fold it under. You fold it and sew it. And the reason for this is kimonos were passed down to other people and to other generations. That's what they were intended to do. So what you can do is take the kimono, if you find something you really like, you bring it over to a kimono shop and just have everything. It's called it's um, an arai hari, where they take out all the stitches from the kimono and then they'll turn it back to the original base of the pieces and then re-stitch it to fit the person who is going to be using it from now on. And it's amazing that kimono, they can last for hundreds of years. Seriously, I have a kimono which was belonged to um, great grandmother. So this was during the Meiji period when this kimono was made. Actually, why these are so convenient kimonos is these are the genes of kimonos. So for example, if you wanted to go out shopping, like this one over here, I put a sticker on my face because, you know, I was completely drunk. <laughs> but this is a, a tsumugi. And a tsumugi is good for going out shopping or going to, if it's raining outside, this is the kimono that it's okay to get a little bit dirty and get splashed with water. It's the kimono that it's okay to run around trains in or um, or hike up a mountain. I don't know what hike up a mountain, but you know, if you got one of those temples to go to, this is the kimono you'd wear. Or if you're going drinking a night out on the town and you kind of want to look classy wearing the kimono, you wear a tsumugi because it makes you look like you know what you're doing. Um, this kimono over here with the green obi that I'm wearing, that one is a mixture of silk and cotton. It's um, kind of unique because you have this kind of a blend. Um, it's called a yuki tsumugi, that's what it is. A tsumugi, by the way, it's, just, it's another way to say it's a certain weave of silk. So um, this is a yuki tsumugi. Yuki tsumugi is from up north. Yuki tsumugi is nice because you're blending two different kinds of materials. You have one in the back and one in the front and you just get glimpses of one or the other. So depending on the angle that you're looking at the tsumugi, it kind of changes color. So the blue and the yellow, they're kind of blending into each other in order to create that kind of a light green for spring. It depends on where you are, but if you look for furugi kimono and uh, in your area, you're going to find all these shops which are selling kimonos, which are secondhand ones. And you, it's a good idea to start there. I mean, all my kimono are mostly secondhand because I got them from grandmother, right? But um, you can get, you can find something really, really cheap that you can get some for, uh, kimono for like 10 bucks. And of course you need uh, all the underwears and stuff like that because you know, um, you know, you wear a different kind of underwear underneath your dress that you would wear underneath the kimono, of course. So you have to buy those yourself separately. You're not going to find them at a furugi and you don't want anyone's old underpants. 
but you can get the kimono itself for 10 bucks, 20 bucks. You can get an obi for 10 bucks, 20 bucks. So if you have $50 and you, and you really want a kimono, yes, you can go and go find a furugi and go find kimono and find something that you like and start from there. And then little by little, you'll branch out and you realize, oh, well, I kind of like this fabric or, oh, and maybe I want something a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler. Um, there are all these variations in kimono, but you have to give yourself a starting point for a branch out from. Uh, that's a furugi kimono and you can get them from anywhere you can get them for like saying yen all the way you can get them up to go saying yen or something it depends on the level and the quality and all these other things of the kimono that you're buying but in those little boxes there you'll find all the little ties and stuff like that you get it for 500 yen this is another summer kimono um or early summer kimono and you can see the other thing that i've done is um the under uh, the underskirt it's called the juba but the underskirt can be anything you want. This particular juban is quite unique because not only am I using an unusual pattern to make it, but this is called a hitashi skirt or azuma skirt, and it doesn't flap open. So for example, you have the um, you have one flap and then you cover it with the other one. And if the wind blows, it goes whee, and you may as well get a little bit of glimpse of ankle there or something like that, you know? Well, hitachi skirt is designed for dancing. So that even if you would like kick up your feet really high, you won't get any glimpses of absolutely anything. And it's designed that way. So um, I have this made out of a dark material with Sakura pattern on top of it. Um, you can't buy these pret de porte you have to actually get them made. But uh, what's fun about it is you're walking along and the wind will blow a big gust and you'll see just a little bit of the higashi skirt and since it's such an unusual and interesting pattern, you'll get a lot of really good comments about that. Not too many comments, of course, but the ones who notice and <laughs> they'll be like, oh, I haven't seen something like that before. So that's another fun part of kimono that you won't always see just from a photograph. You have to actually move and live in it in order to experience. So I love that you tell us about the versatility and openness of kimono culture, as well as tea culture, as well as coffee culture. High quality so, experiences, but you don't have to feel inhibited about trying it out or entering. Is that right? Oh yeah, this is something that everybody can see on their daily life. It's just a matter of um, just looking for it. It's just right there in front of you. Thank you so much, Riki. Thank you everybody for Thank joining. You. Have a good Thank day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining today. What was your favorite part? Why don't you write a question or comment below and I'll reply or I'll get the guests to reply as well. Make sure you write it below. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day. Take care.